stand and worship with you this evening. Happy Father's Day to all of you out there that are fathers. If you're watching online, dear Miss St. Julie, today is such a good day to celebrate. I know I probably don't sound like it because I'm running low on my voice, but you all are going to help me out this evening. And so I'm super excited to be here with you all. How many of you are just glad to be back in the house of the Lord? It got good. He's such a good, good father. And we're going to sing about it today. Amen. Come on, let's just worship him this morning, this evening. Can you put your hands together? a throwback for us. Hey. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. You know it. Come on. I want to see you. Huh. Everybody say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Let's take it to that. 
sing to him. I want to see you. Whoa. God praise all over here. What a great, great, great God we serve. How many came to worship him this evening? If you come to worship him, just slip your hands up in the air. And as the music is playing, come on, just begin to give God your worship. Oh, mm. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night as tell me that you're pleasing that I'm I'm never alone you're a good good father oh Father 
God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by presence. Come on, you sing and say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are. You're honored here. Your glory, oh God, yeah. To be overcome by presence, Lord, yeah. Your presence, Lord, that's what we want, that's what we need, yeah. And Father, tonight this is our request. Oh, let us Your friend is there. 
place and feel the atmosphere. Yeah. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be Just begin to give God your worship. And what I mean by that, just begin to speak well of him. Father, you are so good. There's nobody greater than you. You all didn't come to hear me sing. You came to meet with the Father, so do that now. God, our healer. We came to worship you. You're the only desires of our heart, God. We just want to be where you are. Oh, because where you are, there's freedom. Thank you, Jesus. Where you are, there is healing. Hey, you turn our mourning to dancing. You turn our sorrows to joy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, hey, oh, oh, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come Today, uh, we celebrate and we recognize our earthly fathers. And uh, no matter if your father is the greatest dad in the world or if they weren't around, um, they all disappoint us in some way or shape or form. Uh, they fail us. Um, and it's because we're not perfect. We're just men. Um, but I'm so thankful that I can be reminded today that uh, we've got a heavenly father who is perfect. And he'll never disappoint us. Uh, he'll never let us down, and he loves us deeply. In fact, the scripture tells us that uh, God loved us so much that he sacrificed his own son just for us, just so that we can be free. And so as we get ready to partake in communion, we remember that. Remember that Jesus uh, took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Uh, so let's eat in remembrance. And he took the cup. He said, uh, this is my blood, and it's poured out for us, uh, so let's remember and drink. Lord Jesus, we come uh, thanking you uh, for your sacrifice. God, we thank you for your love that runs deep, and it's a, a love that we'll, we'll never understand. Uh, but we receive it, and uh, we know that today we're free can be free and we can be healed uh, because of the work that Jesus did on the cross. So we say thank you, Lord. Uh, we give you glory and we just pray that uh, you'll be in the midst of this service today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you guys take a seat, if you can, say hi to somebody. Shake somebody's hand. If you don't want to do that, just smile at somebody. Smile and wave. Give somebody a head nod, something. You guys can be seated. Uh, welcome to New Life Community Church in Oaklawn. If this is your first or second time here, uh, please stop at the welcome booth outside. Uh, we got a gift for our first time visitors. And as I say that, I just remember that I didn't even give my father-in-law a gift. And it's his first time visiting, so sorry about that. Um, but please stop, stop at the welcome booth. We got a gift for you. Information 
uh, that we can give you. And also welcome cards uh, are located at the welcome booth um, and under the seats here. Uh, you fill those out, and it's really just us uh, wanting to get to know you, letting you know what we can do to serve you, how we can be praying for you. Um, and just things that will be going on at church. We want to make sure that you guys are aware of that. So if you haven't done that yet, please do so. Uh, and in terms of announcements, this coming Friday, June 24th, we will have our uh, worship night here in the church. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It will be an altar night. And if you guys, I know a lot of you have been to them, but if you haven't, it's amazing. It's an amazing experience. Lamarcus does a wonderful job of leading us in worship. And uh, we just come and have a great time. So that's this Friday at 7. Make sure you're here. Um, and if you don't want to come for Lamarcus, I'll actually be on stage as well. So you can come for that. I got a couple. I got, I got to sing. So. Um, so, yeah, please, please don't forget. Whatever you got going on, cancel it. Show up. Um, today is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Um, after church, we have donuts for you guys. Um, you can take a couple. We've got root beer as well, so, and it's just for dad. So keep your kids away, and ladies, chill out. This is for us, and whatever's left, me and Don will fight in the parking lot for them, and that's, that's what's going to happen. Uh, the last thing is next Sunday is uh, our dinner tonight, our dinner night after service, so please stick around for that. We have fried chicken. So uh, please bring a side, bring drinks and stuff like that. And it's always a good time just to get together after church on Sunday, have dinner together, uh, get to know each other better. So feel free to invite anyone you want, coworkers, friends, neighbors, invite them out, eat dinner together, and we'll uh, have a good time together. All right? I'll pray for our service, and then Don will come up. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you. Uh, thank you just for the gift of uh, being able to, to congregate together uh, on a Sunday. Uh, a day where we celebrate our fathers, Lord, this beautiful day that you've made. Um, we're thankful that we can come together, worship you uh, together as a, as a family. Uh, Father, I ask that you would be with Don as he comes to, to, to give a message from you, praying, Jesus, that you would speak through him uh, and pierce our hearts in ways that only you can. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, everybody. I, uh, I realized for the last couple of weeks, so... Almost every Father's Day, one of the things we do is just say, hey, wear your jerseys of your favorite team. And we didn't, but I wasn't going to lose the opportunity. Uh, so uh, so I'm, I'm sporting my Mighty Ducks jersey today. So, um, hey, uh, if you have been with us for at any point over the last two months, uh, I believe this is actually our eighth uh, Sunday, is we've been working through this series uh, looking at, uh, and, and we're calling it, uh, let's talk about it. Uh, and the reason why is because there's, uh, there, there's a handful of things uh, that sometimes we think about, we struggle through, we wonder about, we have questions, uh, and, and we forget that the Bible has a lot to say about a lot of things. Uh, and so in there, one of the things that popped up, uh, and, and this is all of our New Life locations, so there's 27 locations in three different languages that are all working through this series uh, across Chicago looking at uh, this idea, uh, this reality of, of our, our mental and our emotional health, how we think, uh, what we do with our feelings and our emotions, uh, and those kind of things. And I told you from the jump, on week one, uh, I grew up, for me, emotions were kind of the, even in our house, it was kind of the like, who cares how you're feeling, what do we need to do, right? Uh, and it's like, well, I'm sad. It's like, well, who cares if you're sad? We still have to keep going. We got to keep moving. You know, you, you can't get stuck, that kind of deal. And to be honest, I'm grateful for it uh, in some regards, uh, but, but in a lot of areas, there's places where I've just pushed it aside or not thought about it or those kind of things. Uh, and, and so what we do when we jump into the Bible uh, is start asking these kind of questions. God, what, what do you show us about how we think and how we feel? God, what, what does your word say about it? Uh, how, uh, where in scripture have people gotten it wrong? Where in scripture are people like me? Uh, where they don't know what to do, and so their emotions lead them, and it leads them into some pretty crazy places. And so all we've done is gone through and looked at what does the Bible say about those kind of things. Now, the definition that we've been using for uh, uh, at least a, a working shared definition for what we, you know, so what are emotions, right? Uh, and, and it's a reaction to our experiences and to our thinking. So I've been through some stuff. How I think about what's happening now, those things and the future, right, all shape the reactions of what comes out. 
Okay? Uh, for example, uh, there is one certain thing that evokes a strong emotion of fear in my life, uh, and it is the presence of snakes. Uh, and I'm talking like it could be an inchworm that's like bigger than normal, and I'll scream really loud, and I'll run as though I'm not a 6'2 grown man, right? Uh, and so there's some things that for me, uh, just like, and because, right, and the, all I can go back to is uh, having an uncle that played a joke on me with a snake that scared the pants off me. Uh, and I can remember like vividly when I was really young having a dream of falling into a pond that was infested with snakes. Yeah, so good luck tonight sleeping. But all that to say is, so now when I see a snake, and it may not have teeth, it might be, I don't know, it could be like an inch, where it's probably a rubber thing you buy at the gift shop at the Brookfield Zoo, but when I see a snake, it still like gives me that, right? Uh, knee jerk. Th- I don't want to mess with it. I don't want to be near it. I'm not playing. Like, I don't want you to be like, oh, Don, come on, just hang out with this. Like, I don't want to play with you like that, right? I'm out. I'm good. I'm fine, right? Because there's an emotion that's a reaction, and it's out of some kind of experience and some kind of thinking about that. Uh, and so, so all of us have that, whether it's uh, some trauma stuff from our childhood or things with neglect or issues with anger or all these different things, and a lot of us fail to realize how much of that uh, plays into our spiritual maturity, Uh, how much of that stems out of what we actually believe about God, Uh, and not like a cognitive, do you think God is good, do you think, not not that stuff, like, do you believe that when he says to, to not be afraid that you shouldn't do it in these moments? Do you believe that when Jesus says, uh, don't worry, because who, if by worrying, could have a single out of your day, and you're like, yeah, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it, though, because I feel like that's better for me. Instead of saying, okay, if God says not to, i got to work on not worrying, which means i got to work on trusting. So that's kind of been the stuff we've been going through. One of the areas that's been helpful for me uh, in in reading and preparing for this has been uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, I don't know if you've ever read it. Uh, You know, we could do a show of hands if you even know how to spell it. And my wooden, I'm grateful for autocorrect because I've botched this thing so many times, right? But in this book of Ecclesiastes, it's in the Old Testament what's called wisdom literature, Uh, Which means it's kind of like these uh, um, uh, proverbial, kind of like nuggets. It's kind of the idea. Like like just a good, like when you read it, you're like, no, that makes sense. And you read another one, and you're like, oh, that's really good. And you read another one, you're like, oh, man, that's right. It's these like wisdom pieces of nuggets where it's like, if I actually believed that and lived into that, I, I think I'd be better. I think this would do stuff in me. Now, wisdom literature in the Bible has so much to say. And here's why it matters for today. Wisdom literature, so Psalms, Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, the book of James in the New Testament, has so much to say about uh, the experiences and the thinking that we have. A lot of how the Bible instructs us to be wise is to redirect and recourse our thinking and to rethink and have a new perspective or image on our experiences. It also talks about the perspective we have. Wise people view money this way, foolish people view money that way. Wise people think about things this way, foolish people think about things this way. It's the set of glasses you put on when you're processing and thinking through what's going on in life. And pay attention, and all of that rolls into this, and how we live because of it. How do you live because of your perspective? How do you live uh, because of your experiences? How do you live because of your thinking? Now, I want to jump right in, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2. Verse 1, we get a little introduction into uh, the the image or the story behind the book of Ecclesiastes, but if you want a little bit of uh, a a small sample of wisdom, here we go with chapter 1, verse 2. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything's meaningless. The altar's open. Let's go. No, I'm kidding, right? But he starts off by saying, listen, everything I thought mattered doesn't matter. Everything we put weight and value into doesn't matter. But here's what he's really saying. The Greek word there, and I know you want to say it, so we're going to do it together. The, uh, the, sorry, the Hebrew word is havel. So go ahead and say havel. Okay, so when he says meaningless, meaningless, it's havel, havel. Everything is havel. And what that word means, it's not, uh, well, you know, if you've got a, like a good King James, like the real Bible, uh, it, you'll hear vanity, right? If, if it's another one, you might hear meaningless. But what it doesn't mean is that it doesn't have any value. What it actually means is that it's temporary and it's unable to provide purposeful meaning. The word literally means vapor or smoke or mist. It gives this image of of something that's extremely temporary. 
Something that you can see, right? And this is kind of like the movie uh, cinema image of like, you know, when they see the ghost and they put their hand through it and it kind of like disappears and goes away. You can't grab onto it. It's not actually tangible. You can't do anything with it. And all the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, and what he'll do for the rest of the book is take these different topics and he'll go through and show how you can try to reach and grab and hold on to these things, but you can't because it's like a vapor, it's like a mist, it's, it's meaningless, it's vanity. Does that make sense? And so what he does, and I, here's why I think it connects into what we're talking about in this series, is because if we could get our minds wrapped around our, uh, and our perspective shifted towards the things that actually matter, we'd be able to see clearly the things that don't matter. Proverbs often says it's the wise man or woman who can see things in the value that they actually have. It's the fool that chases after everything, hoping it solves everything. And so what I want us to do in the book of Ecclesiastes, right, it's helpful. Now, it's hard to preach through a 12-chapter book, so don't worry. We're not going verse by verse, and you'll be out of here before midnight. But... um, but, but it's helpful to look through and see because we've got potentially King Solomon, the wisest person that's ever lived, who's giving a book about everything he's ever done. And if you read through there, he, because we've got kids in the room, I can't read all of it because he's tried a bunch of stuff, right? Like late night MTV stuff and has come to the conclusion none of it did anything he hoped it would. And what I want us to look at as we go through is Ecclesiastes has a character called the teacher who gives us life lessons as one who has done every earthly thing and has sought any earthly knowledge to find meaning and purpose, but comes to the conclusion that it's all vapor, it's all smoke, it's all temporary, and it's all non-understandable, which I know is probably a word I made up, but... What I mean to say is you can't fully, he says, I've read all the books about topic and I have more questions. The idea, if you're you're trying to be the the end all know all on a topic, you'll never get there. You can't know everything. Even that in of itself is meaningless. I want us to be in Ecclesiastes because so much of our mental and emotional health derives out of our perspective on life, our past experiences, our current reality, and our future possibilities, and the way we emote, uh, the way we, we, we re- uh, react based on our emotions towards the past and towards our current and towards whatever could be, will really play into how we think and feel about what's going on. Uh, listen, and here's what I mean. Here's why perspective matters so much. Think about it this way. I want, think about all the things you're worried about, at least your top two, the, the biggest things you're worried about in life right now. And like the deep ones, like the big worries, right? Now think about this. Do you think that's the same stuff that a Ukrainian soldier is currently worried about? Probably not. They left their family at the border a couple months ago. Probably doesn't know if they're ever going to see them. My guess is the things I'm worried about that I think are the biggest things in the world are not the biggest things to, you get the image. Because it's perspective. As a Christian, you're afraid of things that a Christian in northern India is not concerned about. Because they're undergoing like real persecution, like being pulled out of the house and shot in front of your family type stuff because you believe in Jesus. So the stuff I worry about because of my perspective is not the same thing as a a brother and sister in Christ in northern India is concerned about because we have different perspectives. Is that helpful? Right? Uh, Think about it this way. If we're going to take a trip in history, uh, a lot of us, uh, how do you handle difficult situations? Right? Right? For a lot of us, it's like, man, we feel uh, burdened and overloaded and all this stuff. And I was watching a couple of movies this week, and man, one of the things that brought me to uh, was thinking through how do I handle difficult situations. And in one of these movies uh, was about this um, a, 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 a mother who was in slavery with her kids and watching her husband get sold off and her kids get sold off. And to think, how do I handle difficult situations compared to a slave mother from 150 years ago? How did they handle difficult situations? Perspective's helpful. Think about this. How do we grieve? How how do we handle loss and sorrow compared to a Holocaust survivor who watched their family separated when they got off the train of the concentration camp and had to grieve that? You get the image. I don't think comparison's always helpful. 
But sometimes it's helpful for us to realize some of the times the thing that, things that we get overwhelmed by are just because of our perspective, not because of the reality. And it's helpful for us to get a different image, to zoom out of just our life, to look at the global experience of humanity, which God has a pretty good take on since he created it, right? And to see what does God speak into and what does he share about how we're doing. Our perspective about our experiences shapes our thinking and our emotional responses. So pay attention to this. If we can discipline our perspective... If we, can, if we can actually uh, um, uh, take a hold of that and make sure that the way we see is the way God wants us to see, right? Some of you, at least you know how to do it with your mouth when you walk into church. I don't know about outside of here, uh, but you know how to talk in church versus like, you know, like lunch shift at work kind of stuff, right? Because you know how to discipline yourself given the reason and the situation and the circumstances. The reality is we've got more control than we probably think we do over certain areas of our life. If we can take our perspective and, 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 and make it captive to the gospel, make it captive to Christ, we can mature the mental and emotional aspects of our life. It's all about discipleship. How do we become more and more like Christ in the way we think and in the way we feel, and today, because of our perspective, all right? Now, the first thing I want us to look at is this. If we're gonna dis, uh, disciple our perspective for the sake of our emotions, the first thing I want us to pay attention to, and this is all out of the book of Ecclesiastes, is to accept that we are consumed and affected by the meaningless. That a lot of things we worry about are things that the teacher in Ecclesiastes say there's, that it's meaningless, it's temporary, it's vapor, it's mist, it's here today and gone tomorrow. When you reach out to try to grab it, there's nothing there because it's already gone. The things that we strive for are things we cannot grab our hands around. The teacher in Ecclesiastes teaches us through his journey of trying everything under the sun. You'll read that phrase over and over and over, right? Because what's above the sun? God. Theoretically, you know what I'm saying. So the idea is like, listen, everything, my, my human experience, everything I see when I look around, and if I'm looking around here to find purpose and meaning, what he says is he ends up finding all the cracks in each area. If I think it's money, I realize that money doesn't solve much of anything, right? If I think it's pleasure, I find out that, uh, you know, by the next day, it's gone and I'm already looking for the next thing. If it's, you get the image. So pay it, let's read through some of this. So if we're looking for money to be the thing that solves our problems, chapter 5, verse 10 says this, whoever loves money never has enough. Anybody remember your first job? Remember how little you got paid at your first job? right? I worked at a movie theater. I don't even think we made minimum wage and somehow it was legal, all right? And I remember getting that first paycheck. It was $132 and I thought no one could stop me. <laughs> I was 15 and ready to go, right? You know what I'm saying? Now, if someone handed you a paycheck for the last two weeks and it was $132, you'd have some questions. Why? Because you got more money, but now it just doesn't seem as valuable, you were given more, but you found more to spend it on. That's why he says, whoever loves money, you never have enough. Because more will always get you. He goes, whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is like vapor or smoke. It doesn't solve old problems. It creates new ones. So he says, you can chase all you want to, but you're going to find out there. Let's keep going. Think about things like this. What about status? Man, if I could be in this status, if people would look at me this way, then I feel like I would find some purpose and meaning. But he says in chapter 2, verse 16, he says, for the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. That's not, like, this isn't encouraging stuff on Father's Day, so I apologize. But pay attention, right? Listen, whether you're wise or foolish, Probably about 100 years, not many people are going to remember you. Anybody know their great-great-great-grandpa's name? And that's your great-great-grandpa. Like, I want my great-great-grandkids to, like, have my name written on their wall with a picture, right, where they remember me daily because of what I poured into their great-great-grandpa. You know what I'm saying? Like, I want to, but he says, listen, the reality is you won't be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like a fool, the wise too must die. And the image he gives is this. It's wise to know that your life has an expiration date. Because just like everything else, your life too is temporary. Then he goes on and says this. He's like, so I hated life. 
Because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is vapor or smoke like chasing after the wind. I tried to rise the ladder. I tried to make something out of myself. But no matter how you are seen or what you accomplish, it all goes away within a few years after your death. So he's not saying that work doesn't matter. He's not saying none of that. What he's saying is if that's where you're trying to stake your value, when it goes away, everything you put your value into goes with it. What about significance? Chapter 6, verse 12, he says, For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless, right, temporary, smoke-filled, vapor idea days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they're gone? The stuff you're chasing after, you, you won't be able to grab it. And if you do, it'll be gone quicker, right? Not to say that we don't have value or meaning, but a humble reminder that we are... that. Um, that after we're gone, our accomplishments and the things we've made much of will not last long in history's memory, right? Anybody know the name of the person that invented the air conditioning unit? Is anybody thankful for them, right? We don't remember their name. In my life, it's like outside of like, you know, the grill, it's like the most impressive thing in human history to me, right? And I don't know their names. Why? Because there's a lot of things that we will accomplish that may not have, that may, are, are, what we think is significant, our names may not be as, as attached to it as what we wish they were. What about pleasure? Doing what makes you feel good. And take that down whatever rabbit trail it goes to in your personal life, because that's what it means. In the New American Standard Bible, it says this in chapter 11, 9. Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant uh, during the days of young manhood. And follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. Now listen, if someone would have showed me this Bible verse when I was like late into high school, I would have said, God's blessing everything I'm currently doing, right? So, hey, go do it. Enjoy it. Have fun with it. Do what, whatever your heart leads you to, go for it. But pay attention, right? Because you do this if you want to, but then he goes on with a helpful perspective at the end, uh, continuing in verse 9. Yet know this, as you're doing all that, that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. You can do it if you want to, but just know that doesn't mean God's going to stop watching your life. He's not uh, released the desire for your heart. He says this, so remove, right? We're talking about emotions. Remove grief and anger from your heart. And put away pain from your body for this reason. Because childhood and the prime of life are fleeting. What he's saying, you don't have time to just sit in anger over all this stuff for the rest of your life. Let go of it. Because you're wasting some of your best years on some stuff that's vapor or smoke or meaningless. Don't let emotions linger because you will waste the best of years of your life shackled to your feelings. So much of what we value the most and think are big deals or will solve big problems are fleeting like a temporary smoke as quick as you can see it. It resolves and then it's gone. How much of our life is consumed and affected by the pursuit or desire for more money? Right? And I'm sure everybody, because it's church, you're like, no, 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 not me. Right? Until you pass that billboard that shows how much the Powerball is worth right now. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, that could do some stuff. Right? Uh, what about chasing after things like an important status? Chasing after significance? Chasing after pleasure and what makes you feel good? The hard part for us is that we will continue down this road of thinking that we're on, thinking that we are going to, on this pioneering conquest, to see if maybe we could be the first ones in human history to find meaning in temporary fleeting things. You know what I'm saying? Like, sure, 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 the Bible says that, and yeah, yeah, okay, God said you, right? But I'll bet I could figure this out. I'll bet I could find value in the, right? Give me $2 billion and see if I can't find some value and meaning, right? And what we realize is, Right? That we think we're, we, we could figure that, even though God says it's impossible and human history has proved it to not be true, we think we'd like a crack at it. Right? Or maybe it's this option. Maybe we just aren't wise enough to pay attention to the experiences and wisdom of those who have gone before us. Here's wise words. This quote, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. Anybody know who that's from? The great prophet Jim Carrey, right? And the idea is this. As someone, he's not unsuccessful, right? Someone said, listen, I, I, I was able to do it, and I found out doesn't, it, it didn't solve any of my problems, right? 
Uh, if we keep chasing vapor, mist, smoke, vanity, meaningless things, we will be constantly frustrated from chasing moving targets, expecting lasting and satisfying results. This too is meaningless. Don't worry, we'll get progressively more positive as we go, but it's important we start in the heavy places. The second thing I want us to look at is this. If we're going to disciple our perspective for the sake of our emotions, accept how much of your life is out of your control. Right? And hey, listen, hi, my name's Don, and I'm a control freak. Right? And you respond by saying, hi, Don, thank you. A couple of us have been in the same meetings. That's fine. Right? Okay? Okay. If you're like me, man, I I love to be in control, right? I want to hold the remote. I want to be behind the steering wheel. I I want to be the one making a decision, unless it's the weekends, and that was my Father's Day gift. I don't want to make a decision, right? Uh, There's just moments where it's like, I like to know how this is going to go. If you're in charge, I don't know. If I'm in charge, I do know, right? Now, I'm saying that as a confession, not as a pride statement. A A lot of our emotional and mental issues stem from the desire or compulsion to be in control, And our brokenness comes when we can't control things as much as we wish. A lot of our emotional response comes out of the brokenness in the control that we don't have. Or we've been in control and it's failing and we have to deal with that. Some of us feel defeated that we can't even control our emotions. And the emotions are about the things we can't control. You see the cycle, right? But maybe this too is a perspective issue. We are expecting things that are historically and realistically not going to happen that the world would revolve around us. God's already set all that up in a certain way, and it's not you, right? We need God's perspective to become our own. We need God's perspective to become our own perspective when it comes to control. So read what the teacher in Ecclesiastes have to say. When he's talking about how we want to control our future, in chapter 8, verse 7, he says, since no one knows the future, who can tell someone else what's to come? Now, that sounds like duh statements, except for everything you're worried about is all the what-ifs of what could happen. Why spend your time and energy on it if nobody knows? Right? That's why Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to have enough worries of its own. you got enough going on today. Right? Well, yeah, but if we don't do this, and that doesn't connect to that, and then what if this, and then, oh my goodness, we're going to be homeless, and then if we don't have that, like, I don't know if we're going to be able to put shoes on the kid, right? And then if I can't just walk to work, right? So, like, and, and later you're like, bro, just chill. Like, just hold on, because that's all about what's happening, and you don't know what's going to happen. If you listen to historians, I'm a nerd, so I do, right? And I always love this, is they'll talk about Nazi Germany and how World War II and blah, 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 and they'll say, okay, so you're a historian, you've learned everything there is to know about that. What do you think is going to happen in a couple years? And every historian will answer the same way. Historians don't predict the future, because it's impossible to predict the future. Why? Because God told us in Ecclesiastes, you don't know the future. But so much of our anxiety and our worry come out of the fact that we can't control what's going to happen, and it messes with us. We don't control the future, so there's no sense in worrying about it. What about controlling money and finances and resources? Uh, The writer of Ecclesiastes says this, I've seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to to the harm of its owners. Right? Right? Here's the part we don't see. When people get so much money that it starts breaking them, but they look good, so they feel good, and they think it's all good. He goes on and says, everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil, and they can carry in their hands. Right? The same stuff you came into this world with is the same stuff you're going to have on the other side of it. But that's everything we worry about as we go. And what he says is you aren't in control of that. We spend so many days anxious and depressed about money that it's meaningless once we take our last breath. You've heard the sentiment at funerals or wherever. Nobody on their deathbed is wondering like, man, I wish I just would have bought that other pair of sneakers, right? I knew I should have got that uh, Rodman jersey. I've been looking for it. You know, I wanted it, right? I I knew we should have done this. No, everybody's like, man, I should have called my son more. I really wish uh, that I could go back and take my wife on more dates. I wish, you you get the image? Very little of it has to do with the stuff that we think most about. What about controlling our legacy or career status? Now, this is a long section, but I love the way it flows. Okay, so read this with me. Chapter 2, verse 18, he says, So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me, all of it's meaningless, chasing after the wind. 
He said, I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun, everything I worked hard for and exhausted myself for, uh, because I must leave them to one who comes after me. Because everything I've worked for, when I die, it means nothing to anybody else. And someone else is going to have to pick up where I left off. And who knows whether that person is going to be wise or foolish. You get the image? Everything I've worked to build, all the, 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 the reputation I've built to grow, all of that stuff, when I die, it's going to go to somebody else. And they might be dumb with it. They might be wise, I don't know. And then he says they have, will have control, pay attention. They will have control over all the fruit of my toil, which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. Because I don't have control over how everyone else is going to handle the stuff I've put myself into. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun, for a person may labor with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and when they, and when they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving for which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. What I love is what he says is, he doesn't say don't work, because if you work, your life's going to be miserable. What he does say is just a reminder that whatever you want to accomplish will be passed on to people who don't care as much as you about the things you care about. We are trying to control something that we will lose control over. And the teacher says, this is meaningless. What about controlling our moment of making it big, right? If I could just get there, man, if I could get to that place, if I could have that position, if people saw me this way, chapter 9, verse 11 says, I've seen something else under the sun. Uh, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the street. You get it? Whoever wins the race isn't always the fastest one. Whoever wins the battle isn't always the strongest one. Nor does food come to the wise or the wealthy, to the brilliant, or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Not all of this, right? The wealthiest people in the world are not often the smartest people in the world. But because of where they grew up, the resources that were available to them, and the opportunities of the doors that open, open those doors. I remember a couple years ago, I got to visit uh, in, in Nairobi, Kenya, and there was a kid, I think he was 19 years old, that developed this system. They had an issue in the valley where they lived in where nobody knew what to do with uh, the, the bathroom waste. After they'd gone, they didn't know what to do. So it would poison the waters, and it would do all kinds of stuff. And this 19-year-old kid created this device that would use all of that as fuel to burn things up, to purify water, and to create energy and heat for the community. 19, with, with like waste from the, the garbage pit, could figure this whole thing out. Here's what I know. That kid could probably make way more money if he had different opportunities, if he had different uh, experiences, if he were in a different place. Why? Because sometimes it's just chance. There are times when God intervenes, but so much of life is when and where you were born and where you grew up. Most that are successful are not because they're better or smarter. It may be because they grew up with access to opportunities. So striving to make it big is chasing something that's largely out of your control. Doesn't mean don't work hard for better things. Doesn't mean don't push and be everything you can and give yourself everything you can. It just means if you're trying to be the one that is the best at everything that you do, right? Think about it this way. If Michael Phelps' mom never took him to swim practice and, and insisted he'd be a better soccer player, how would that have gone, right? So a lot of it's just chance. What about if we're worried about all the what ifs? Chapter 11, verse 4 says, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. I've saved this as like an image on my phone because it's helpful for me. Because what he's saying is, if you're a farmer looking out the clouds, you're like, oh man, it might rain today. If it's rainy today, I shouldn't plant, so I'll wait till tomorrow. And then you look at the clouds, you're like, oh, it's going to be really windy, and so I shouldn't. You do that enough where all you're doing, and you don't actually do work. You don't actually do anything because you're worried about all the what ifs. Then May, and then June, and then July, and then August, and September pass, and October, when you should have been reaping a harvest, you never actually planted seeds because you were too worried about all the what ifs. And we're anxious about the what-ifs, and we get depressed about the what-ifs, and we get angry about the what-ifs. 
And so we never actually do things, right, if we're giving a prophetic word into our culture. We don't actually do anything because we're emotionally engaged in all the what-ifs. What he says is, whoever looks at the clouds will now reap. So the actual work that needs to happen doesn't happen because we look at all the what-ifs of what could happen. We're so concerned about the future that we're not focused on what we should be doing today. So perspective, you can't be in as, con- in as much control as you want, but you can trust God with everything. You can't be in control of everything, but he's already in control of everything. It's smoke, it's vapor, it's mist to strive for control. This too is meaningless. Now don't worry, this third point, we're going to take a real sharp angle towards the positive, all right? But it's important because if we know uh, that, that the things that we find value in, there's nothing valuable there. Not nothing valuable, there's nothing that can sustain the amount of and level of purpose and meaning we want to give it. And then if we know that we're not in as much control as we wish we were, it helps us think through our perspective on how we actually engage people, how we actually engage our days, how we actually engage our work life. And we land on this, and this is what the teacher gives us over and over in the book of Ecclesiastes, is to accept God's gift in the ordinary, is to look at the people that you're actually around rather than worrying about people that you're not. It's to actually pay attention to the work that you do have and that you are supposed to do rather than looking at the work that everyone else isn't doing. It's to pay attention to the good times you could be having rather than everybody else and what everyone else is doing. Once our pursuit for meaning and striving for control are confronted, challenged, and understood as a temporary vapor or mist, then we start pursuing that there is, uh, what is there in this life to find deep value in? I love this. Here's one. Uh, The idea that we are not to live life alone. You need people around you. That's one of the things we find value in. Now, this isn't a marriage verse, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, it says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other one up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. You get the image? Everything is isolation by yourself. I got this. Listen, I got this is not the best plan for life. To understand that you need community. You need people who are asking you hard questions, who are encouraging you when it's deserved, who are challenging you when it's needed. This isn't a marriage verse. It's a verse about deep friendships. Listen, isolating yourself and distancing yourself from others is not a defense mechanism. It's a death sentence. You need people who are with you and who are for you. There's there's value there. That's not mist. That's not smoke. If you've got that, you've got a lot. He also goes on and says this about the ordinary. Chapter 5, verse 18. This is what I observe to be good. That it is appropriate. Now, listen. I'm going to put this verse on the kitchen wall of my house. Because it's appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun for a few days of life God has given them because that's their lot. It's to look around at the life you actually have and just be satisfied and pleased with it. Man, I'm thankful that this is my family. We don't have it all together, right? But man, this is good. It's to be able to look at the job you do have. It's toilsome labor. He doesn't say it's not difficult. But to look at the job you do have and to look at it every day and say, I'm glad I've got one. And if this is the one I got, I'm happy for whatever happens today. You got the cranky dude that you work with. Maybe you're the cranky dude that everyone else has to work with, right? But you look at it and you're like, I'm, I'm glad that this, if, if I can be satisfied in this, like God, thank you. Let him be in control of the next job or the next opportunity. But I guarantee part of that door opening when God decides to do it is whether you were faithful with the one he gave you now. He says, man, if I was able to find satisfaction and joy here, right? Enjoy a good meal. The word of the Lord, right? (laughs) Like really enjoy it. Like savor it, right? Uh, I had a steak this week. Thank you, Jesus. Right? And usually I'm in this race with myself to see who can eat my plate the fastest. And I usually win, right? 
But man, slowing down and just enjoying a meal, like not scarfing it down for consumption, you know, just to keep moving, that's the image you get. Just, just actually enjoy, like you have to eat, but enjoy, the, enjoy it. It's a good moment. He says, enjoy a drink, right? He doesn't say like drink so much that you're numb, you won't enjoy any of that. But slow down and just enjoy those moments of calming down. Let it bless you. Find satisfaction and joy in the work that you do every day. Verse 19 says, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions, the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, to accept that this is, this is it. I'm not in Elon Musk's position. I don't know what to do with all my billions. All right? I'm not in the position of someone that owns an island in the Caribbean. Uh, that's not my deal, right? But I got this. And if I can be happy with this, there's meaning and value. There's something tangible that I can hold on to. There's, there's, there's purpose there. He says, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with the gladness of their heart. You get the image there in that last verse? For someone who's content... It's a good word, content, with things as they are. You're not the one, man, five years ago, that was a good year, you know, way back then. You have, you have an inability to look back at better days because you're just thankful for the ones that you're in. And you have an inability to be worried and concerned about whatever's coming because tomorrow morning you're going to wake up into that day and you're going to be thankful for the ordinary that it is. Does that make sense? And he says, that's, that's not meaningless. That's actually got value. It's got value. If you're doing this right, you don't look backwards claiming that those were good years because you've learned how to make these days the good days. The last one, and this is how he sums up or wraps up the whole book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, verse 13. He says, now that all has been heard, 11 and a half chapters of wisdom. He says, now that all that's been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. You get the image? He says, after all this stuff, just know there's going to come a day where all the vapor is going to go away because you're going to breathe your last breath, and then that's it. And then what really matters is did you pay attention to the stuff that really matters? Was it a money chase? To see who could get more and buy more, right? You want the slingshot, so you've been like saving, you want that. And you also want like, you know, the super nice car, so you've been saving for that one. You want the bigger house, so, you, so that's all you're pursuing. Or you really want people to think something of you, right? Uh, your Instagram looks ridiculous, because all four followers like everything you do, right? And you're like, man, if I can just get like three million more, I'll be a billionaire, right? So you pursue and you pursue and you pursue and you pursue. And here's the reality. Do you love today? Are you thankful for what's happening in your life right now? Can you look around with contentment and say, God, you've been so good. I know work's hard. I know it's difficult, but I'm grateful. Like genuinely grateful. Have a reverent respect for God. He says, fear God. And it's not the idea that you're scared of him. It, it's this, it's this, it's a weighty, uh, it, it, a lot of it's the same root as the word glory. It's this idea that there's a heaviness to God that, 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 that's deep. Have that kind of respect for God and it will guard your thinking, it will guard your feeling, and it will guard your acting. My guess is that most of your emotionally driven seasons of life have been ones where your perspective of God was of him being belittled, distant, or ignored. If you hold God where he actually belongs, then what he says actually carries weight in your life. And, and if you're like me, listen, hey, and yeah, if you get some dude that comes up to you in the mall and is like, hey, dude, do you want me to help you with your money investments? No, bro, I don't want you to help me with my money investments, right? But my guess is if you got a like, handwritten letter from Warren Buffett saying, hey, could I help you with your finance? You'd be like, bro, I'll be there in four hours. Like, I, right? Show it. Why? Because he knows what he's doing. What it says here is, would you hold God to that level of place where when he speaks into your life, whatever you say, if, the, if this is you saying it, I want to do it. If you tell me go this way, I'm going to go that way. However you want me to do it, because I hold you at this level. Then it also says to keep his commandments. That will give you direction, understanding, and maturity. My guess is your most emotionally driven seasons of life have been one where your obedience to God's commands 
were either ignored, belittled, or non-existent. Right? Because we can fall into one of two camps. One, we can keep chasing the same things, expecting different results. And you know that's the definition of insanity. Right? Doing the same thing over and over. No, no, no. I'm, you know, I'm just going to keep getting those scratch-offs because one of these is going to be my ticket. God already told me in a vision. Right? And so if I keep doing this, if I keep chasing that, if I keep wanting this, if I keep going, listen, if you keep doing the same thing and you get the same results, that you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy. Emotions. The pointlessness, and here's the second one, the pointlessness of the world will always win. And that's the idea of hopelessness, despair. So you're either gonna go crazy or you're gonna get yourself in a pit of despair. And that's where all of that gets you. So it looks like either of those perspectives will ensure life of insanity and hopelessness. So there has to be another way, right? What if we weren't just looking for purpose under the sun? What if our purpose and meaning came from above the sun? In fact, what if the God above actually showed up here to the world we live in under the sun to save us from this? To save us for what's above? Jesus removed the barrier the teacher can't seem to look past. All we can see is this. All the teacher can see is what's below the sun. But when God shows up in Jesus, what he shows us is what life is like in the kingdom. Uh, What does the kingdom of God look like? How does it act? It's not worried about politics and elections. It's not worried about inflation and all this other stuff, right? It's not worried about all these other things, right? Because God's got stuff he's paying attention to. And so when the kingdom shows up, it gives us a different perspective. Uh, God removed the barrier. He brought the divinity of God to the despair of our lives to show us how to live a life of meaning and purpose. Where the teacher can't seem to get past this idea, you can't learn enough to discover meaning. Jesus says stuff like this, know me and you'll have all you need. The teacher says, you'll never find enough pleasure to fulfill meaning. Jesus says, I'll give you overflowing life. The teacher says money will never give you enough. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom and its righteousness and all these things will be given to you by your heavenly father who sees you and who loves you. The teacher says you can't work enough to find purpose because it's only temporary. Jesus says our work in him will last forever. The teacher says everything dies. Jesus said as long as your life is found in me, your life will never expire. The teacher in Ecclesiastes tells us your purpose will not come in chasing after the wind. Jesus tells us your purpose will come when you start following him. And what I want us to see is this, our mental and our emotional healing and maturity needs a perspective shift on how we live life. And nothing will do that like when you surrender your life to a new king. Because I remind myself often, the old one doesn't work. So when you surrender to a new king, and the Holy Spirit in you to guide you closer to him, that's when we start seeing where is their purpose, where is their meaning, where is life in pursuit of things that are not vanity or meaningless or like a vapor mist or smoke, like a chasing after the wind. It's a pursuit of Jesus because it's tangible and you can see the fruit of it, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. We see it actually play out because it's not just chasing after stuff we can never grab onto. It's watching it bear fruit in our day-to-day lives. Some of us, some of us will find a life filled of trying to chase after the wind, hoping that that next job, if this business works out, if this money comes through, if all these things pan out the way I want, that's then I'll be, pay attention to the words of the teacher. Enjoy today. Be thankful for what you've got. You've got a heavenly father who's promised to love you, provide for you, care for you. The question for us is, have we received Christ? Have we we surrendered over to him? I love this. A lot of us need Jesus as king. A lot of us need community because a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Some of us have fallen over, but we're too ashamed to ask somebody to pick us up, and we've not actually walked in the kind of friendships where anybody notices the fact that we've been living, falled over. If you got people walking with you, 
You've invited them in and you've not pushed them away and you've let them know all the stuff. You've welcomed somebody who will walk with you through those seasons. Some of us need to find places where we can toil, where we can serve, where we can uh, give, not trying to figure out what we expect from God, but trying to figure out how we can serve him. What do we have to offer? How do we give? How do we live in a place where we can be content and grateful for how God's using our lives rather than being discontent and angry because of what we're not getting for our lives? What I want us to see is this. And man, listen, I've been, so this whole, I knew I was gonna be trying to preach an entire book of the Bible, right? And so this week I've had, there's a a Street Lights, which is a Chicago group that uh, does audio Bible stuff. And I love it, love it, love it. So I've been listening to Ecclesiastes all week just on repeat. And it's been crazy. There's stuff in there. Like it's better to finish something than to start something. And and my mantra is I'm really good at starting stuff. I'm horrible at like actually finish. And then I read scripture and I'm like, okay, Don, you need to finish some projects. You you need to stop and just get some of this stuff. Why? Because God said so. Because that's wisdom, because there's meaning and purpose and value, is to get some of this stuff into you, right? It's at Psalm 119.11 where David writes and he says, I've buried your word in my heart so I wouldn't sin against you. If you get this stuff in there, it's going to be the stuff that comes out because it shifts your perspective. And if your perspective changes, then your thinking changes, and the, whatever you've experienced in the past, whatever you're experiencing now, and whatever's going to come in the future, your emotions towards it will be more matured, it'll be more discipled, because you've allowed the word of God, the wisdom of God, and the leading of the Holy Spirit help you in those moments, right? Doesn't mean you're not going to get sad. Jesus gets sad. That's not sin. Doesn't mean you're not going to get anxious. It doesn't mean that you won't fall into despair. Jesus weeping tears of blood at Gethsemane. So that can't be sin. But it may be just to stay there because we're not allowing God to work in us to move us through and to push us towards where he wants us to go. So here's what I want us to do as we close. I would love for us uh, to stand and we're gonna worship together. Uh, And and as we do, right, uh, here's what I know. And we're gonna wrap up this series next week. Um, And um, yeah, we'll we'll focus on some other stuff going on through the summer. Uh, But we're gonna wrap this series up next week. uh, And and, and I've loved it. Uh, And it's been good for me because this is an area where I tend to, I told you, I tend to not focus on because I'm looking at all these other things. I'm just trying to get stuff done. Who cares how I feel? What needs to happen? That's usually how I roll. It's been helpful to think through because there's stuff I've had to look at. There's perspectives I've needed to grab onto because I've just neglected it. And it's been good for me to let God speak into areas that I pretend like they don't exist. Here's what I want us to do. Some of you, we have uh, in the back, there's a banner that says prayer. Uh, We've got people back there who want to pray over you. And some of you need prayer and you need to lay down some areas that you've been trying to control and find meaning in. And you know it's holding up a lot of stuff and you know it's messing with a lot of things and you know you need to let that go. Would you go back there and just let somebody pray over you? And if you walked in this room with stuff that's just heavy and you just need someone to put a hand on your shoulder and to pray over you and has nothing to do with emotions or the book of Ecclesiastes or anything, would you please just go back there and and let us pray over you? Uh, All of us in this room, here's my hope, is as as we worship. Um, What we're doing, and I love this song, what we're doing as we worship in these moments are offering everything we've got to God, right? Uh, Roman says, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Uh, what he means is not just your, your sins. Don't just give that to God. It's everything. It's your brain. It's the way you think. It's your heart. It's the way you feel. It's your uh, physical body. It's the way you act and what you do. Is you roll all that back up onto the altar and you say, God, this is all yours. Because that's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. And sometimes we've kept our emotions away because we want to feel how we want to feel. We want to get angry if we want to get angry. We want to handle it how we want to handle it. Sometimes in our thinking, we've let that brokenness there hold us back from letting God break through stuff that we want to matter more than anything to the rest of the world. And God's just asking us, would you let me lead you through it to the other side of it? So during this time, would this be a chance for you And you can do it, whether you want to come up and get on a knee uh, and and, and cry that out to God, whether you want to just where you're at, lift your hands up. And and here's what I love. All over scripture, lifting hands uh, throughout the Bible is this symbol of just letting go, 
right? Just releasing it. You can't hold on to anything that you're not grabbing on to. So when you open up, you're just saying, God, take it, take it, take it. But it also leaves your hands empty to catch something too. And it allows you to say, God, after I've been emptied, I just want to receive. Whatever you've got, I want to be filled up. Because if God doesn't fill me up, something else is going to. And so maybe for you, that's a posture of worship that you need to take. I would just encourage you to physically respond in some way. Physically respond in some way to let God know. And for you yourself, you need to do it, is to lay all that stuff down at the cross and let Jesus be what fills you up. Lord Jesus, as we worship and as we sing, Father, my prayer is this. God, that there would be emotional and mental healing in our church for no reason other than that's your job. You've promised you'd save us, and it's not just from bad stuff we've done, it's from stuff that we're currently uh, slaves to, stuff that currently has us in bondage, things that we can't mentally break through, things we can't emotionally work our way out of. So Lord, would you, Father, would you, would you take the cuffs off? Would you show us you can break those chains? Would you remind us that you're not just big enough for our sin, you're big enough for the stuff we're still dealing with today? that we would release that, that there would be peace and joy, that we would live right because you've been good and you're king over our life. So Father, as we worship, God, I pray that we would, we would have the ability to open those hands up and let go of all the things that we try to control, that we've tried to find meaning in, that we're searching for, and say, God, none of that works. We wanna lay all that at your feet. But God, with those empty hands, would you fill us up with who you are and what you have for our life? God, would Jesus show up in our life if we don't have him? Would the spirit of God move in? God, would this be a moment where you show up and move in as we surrender our lives to you? Some of us for the first time, some of us for like the 575th time. Because we can't live without you. We can't feel without you. We can't think without you. So God, would you show up into every area of who we are so we would be discipled to be more like Jesus and we would be free to live more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing it again. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Hallelujah. Our God reigns. Hallelujah. Our God reigns forever all our days. Hallelujah. One more time, hallelujah, hallelujah, our God reigns, hallelujah, our God reigns, hallelujah, our God, He reigns forever, all our days, hallelujah. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, you give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, you give me wisdom, you know just what to do. Man, if you're like me, I was singing through that thing. If I could just do that on Tuesday, though, that I wouldn't be overwhelmed, that you're where my help comes from, if, if, that's, if that's how I was thinking on Wednesday. And so what we want to do, I, and I love, and LaMarcus probably doesn't give enough, some, himself enough credit, the songs we sing in worship are the songs I carry with me through the week. I'm finding stuff on Spotify, trying to carry it. And he actually has a, if you look up New Life Oakland on Spotify, you'll find he keeps a playlist so you can follow the worship songs we do. And man, for me, because it gives me the prayers for my week. And songs like that are the lyrics that I need to be praying. It's reminders, it's stuff that my, I need to train my brain to think different. And for a lot of us, my prayer is this, uh, is that this is the stuff that, that reacts more naturally out of us. You know what? I'm not gonna be overwhelmed because I know where my help comes from. That God's the one who reigns. He's king, not all this other stuff, not these realities, not, the, not politics, not the news cycle. It's Jesus. Jesus reigns. That's who reigns. We need to remember that because it shapes our perspective and it trains us in discipleship over our thinking and over our feeling. So let me pray for us and, uh, and then we'll, we'll dismiss. Lord Jesus, Father, we've come to be reminded that you are Lord over all things. And that includes... Areas, some weeks we'll talk about finances. Some weeks we talk about uh, just word for word through your word and what you teach to the church and how we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to be mindful of certain things. Some weeks we look at a lot of different things, but God, there's weeks where we need to be reminded that we need to take our thoughts and our feelings captive and surrender them and make them obedient to you, Jesus. God, we're grateful that you've created us like you to be people who feel. We have those things that naturally come out of us because they naturally are responses for you. But God, would you help us shepherd those towards you, not the things we want to get worried about, not the things we get angry about or anxious about, not the things we lose hope in and turn to despair. But God, would we be so anchored in who you are that we can look at today and say, these are good days. I'm content with what you've done. I'm content with who you are. I'm grateful for what's happening. God, I'm blessed. And not because we think in some positive self-help type stuff, uh, but because our souls are anchored in your hope. Because when you speak, we believe it. And God, we do believe that you are doing incredible things in our time. And we confess that so many times we look at all the stuff that we wish you were doing 
and that we wish was different and we wish was changed, that we lose sight of what you're actually doing and how good it is. So God, would you move? God, would you take our overwhelmed reality and God, would you move us to an overcoming reality to be reminded of who you are and what you've done? So Lord, I pray uh, that whether it's like the women who went to the tomb to, uh, to, to cry and to uh, get wrapped up in despair and grief, and in that same day, because of your resurrection, were turned to joy and gladness, God, would you do that in our lives? Not for any reason other than the fact that you came out of the grave, and that's enough for us to turn around in our life what we think and what we feel based on who you are and what you've done. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, gentlemen, on your way out, grab yourself a dad's root beer. You get two donuts, choose them wisely, and fend your kids off like little rabbits trying to chase after it. So no, please uh, be blessed. Uh, just as a church, we wanna say thank you to all the guys. You don't have to like prove offspring. Uh, just go, if you're a guy, go, go get some donuts. Enjoy that. That's a gift from everyone in this room that just wants to honor and appreciate you guys. We love you and have a good week.